So uh, we've had one view from government, and now another view. And and uh, do you have like a big disclaimer first about how you know your 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 you the, the 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 expansive claims you're about to make about the future of American intellectual property policy are not never, never, do not bind the administration. It's funny. I don't think of you as the kind of person who, person who pushes disclaimers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually standard col- practice. I'm collecting them. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, so uh, let me say that. Uh, what I do have to say, and what the, the lawyers always tell me to say, is um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the administration or the federal government. I'm here in my personal capacity, so take my views as my own. So my, my favorite um, book dedication of all time, uh, which is well known to most of you in this room, is um, Larry Lessig's uh, in Code. Um, his book Code, he dedicates the book to uh, Charlie Ness, and, he, and says, uh, the, the dedication says, to Charlie, whose every idea is crazy for one year. Um, <laughs> And, uh, uh, and I have to say that um, Carl has sort of taken that and de- uh, compressed the time frame down to a matter of months at this point. So what I viewed uh, initially as, a, as, some, uh, as something of a, uh, of, a, of a windmill tilting exercise around law.gov has taken off um, and has gathered steam uh, largely through the workshops uh, that, that this is one of. But... Uh, uh, also through uh, the advocacy that you've been doing in front of the courts of appeals, uh, in front of the executive branch agencies and so forth, it's really cool to see. It's been um, really kind of amazing. I've described um, uh, numerous times internally in the White House a set of projects that we're doing as the Carl.gov initiatives. So it's all things that Carl has cooked up that uh, we've now kind of embraced and are running somewhat sheepishly with because we wish we had thought of them first. Um, uh, Jamie, by the way, get, get, sort of qualifies under, or Professor Boyle, sorry, uh, qualifies <laughs> in that category too because I, I was indeed one of his students. The book that you wrote while uh, you were um, uh, teaching me was uh, Shaman's Software and Spleens. And because you were my professor, I read it and I thought this is the most esoteric and weird thing I've read. It made no sense to me at the time. Uh, but I've come back to read it a couple of other times and it is you know, one of those books that was way ahead of its time in terms of understanding the way in which intellectual property law is literally the regulatory scheme for an information world um, and why taking uh, those um, uh, laws very seriously is, uh, is, is essential to getting it right. Anyway, so um, let me just move on from the wild praise for everybody to uh, talk about um, sort of the intersection of law.gov and the open.gov work that we've been doing. So. Um, On January 21st, the day after he took office, President Obama issued as his first memorandum the Open Government Memorandum. So this is, you know, four square corners kind of formal document. It's um, obviously available online. And it mapped out the work plan for the Open Government Initiative for the first kind of year and and change. And uh, it was built around uh, transparency, participation, and collaboration as the kind of three organizing principles for the work. Um, and it said that we're going to spend uh, 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 basically the rest of 2009, uh, at which point uh, working on the um, initiative and getting it right and understanding what we're going to do, and then we'll issue a directive. So the directive came in December, and that's what uh, David uh, uh, Ferrier was just referring to, which is the directive uh, says every federal agency has to cook up an open government plan. And it's got to cover the following topics, and then they're all going to be made public. And what we're actually doing right now is we're in the process of grading them. So we're going to be sort of green, yellow, red, uh, uh, grading uh, the different agencies on a bunch of dimensions that we ask them to address. Um, and uh, we'll work, keep working our way through this, hopefully you know, kind of highlighting and celebrating the successes and um, shaming the laggards um, and working our way towards genuinely uh, bottom-up in, in a certain sense, from the agency side anyway, bottom-up development of open government practices. The broad uh, project of the first year in terms of open data was really about saying, like, let's figure out some data that we can make public, and then let's get that data to be public. The longer-term project is, is about uh, culture change. So this is also something David just referenced, but it is fundamentally the revolution we're trying to pull off. Um, uh, the great thing about Moore's Law... Uh, over the last 30 years is that it's made computing power so cheap and uh, networking uh, in terms of, you know, the price per bit is cheap and is getting cheaper all the time. So you can have uh, these 
this vast sea of free stuff that we all take advantage of online every day, you can take the technology that makes that possible and apply it in a governmental context to make transparency, participatory uh, 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 rule uh, making and policy making activities, collaboration across the previously isolated and siloed units of government, all of this becomes possible and in fact uh, uh, economically compelling, not just, uh, not just doable. Um, uh, so that's kind of the, 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 the theory. The um, next year is going to be about trying to instantiate culture change in more concrete ways. Um, the work that David's been doing at the National Archives is kind of emblematic of this. He mentioned the Federal Register. One of my favorite examples of, of what happens when you take the Federal Register and start publishing it in uh, XML rather than uh, locked up in, in either PDFs or you know, the other kinds of formats that it had been published in is that it enables third-party developers to make applications one of the ones that he mentioned, FedThread, allows you to do the following cool thing. You can type in your zip code, you can type in search terms, and then anytime something that gets published uh, that matches that, you get a text message or an email or uh, shows up in your RSS reader. Um, that's really cool, and it, by the way, puts out of business a number of uh, companies that have made as their business model um, the job of uh, reading the Federal Register and alerting their clients every time something relevant to them turns up. Now suddenly they've, you know, going to have to do something that actually creates value rather than just rides on uh, scarcity, which no longer needs to exist and, in fact, does not exist. So that's the kind of awesome service that you can um, that you can provide when you do something as simple as taking uh, text and making them available in machine-readable, standardized formats. Um, so uh, you know, so we've gone from the memo to the directive to the plans. Uh, 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 there's a lot of work that needs to be done on data.gov um, in order to really make it sing. We need to build out developer tools. We need to build out APIs. We need to um, uh, uh, catalog and index a lot of the mashups so that people will feel recognized and rewarded as part of the community. We need to um, uh, uh, wrestle with a lot of the standardization of data and metadata, um, uh, enrich and enhance the metadata that we've already got available. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight, though, is a tension, and it's um, at least tangentially, I think, important in the law.gov context, broadly speaking, and that is the following. One of the things that surprised me, or was new to me anyway, when I, when I uh, came to Washington, was um, that the culture of government, while often derided as conservative and risk-averse and closed and insular and all that, also has a very, very important virtue, um, which is that there are many people in the government who take very seriously the quality of the data that the government puts out. They work their fingers to the bone uh, to ensure that the quality of the data that they're putting out is, uh, is excellent. And um, the culture that produces that is not something, I think, to be jettisoned lightly. Um, many of the labor statistics, economic statistics, um, frankly, weather statistics, you, you name the, the, kind of the, the sort of the data set. If there are people out in the economy relying on it, you want your government uh, to be uh, 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 obsessively focused with ensuring that that data is very high quality. And I think one of the tensions then is we're pushing agencies to move faster, to publish their data sooner, uh, get it up more rapidly, uh, reduce the lag time between creation and publication. Um, and uh, we have to figure out how uh, to strike the right balance. Now, there are some ways to do this. Uh, you know, for example, when we publish GDP statistics, we do it in three waves. You publish the initial estimate, then you publish a revised estimate, then you publish the final number three months apart. And economists and Wall Street and people relying on those numbers know that you apply a discount factor to the initial numbers and maybe a smaller discount factor to the next set of numbers, and then you rely on the numbers when they come out. So we know how to, it is possible to publish tentative data. But one of the interesting um, experiences, one that was, I think, very uh, tense or sort of pivotal for the open gov movement was, um, and this is, I can talk about this as an observer because it was an independent board that did this, but th there was a, re a, a board established with the uh, Recovery Act funds, the stimulus bill in uh, January 2009 called the Recovery Board. The Recovery Board's job is to oversee the spending of stimulus money. One of the things they did was set up a website called recovery.gov. Um, where all of the data that is being reported up from recipients of stimulus dollars 
gets uh, pulled together and published. So anyway, there was a moment last fall when the recovery board uh, dumped a, the, the, this huge, massive pile of data onto recovery.gov. Nice website. They actually did a nice job of it. I think you know we learned some lessons on the technical side about about it. But what was worrisome was that um, as soon as the data went up, it was you know from more than you know tens of thousands of recipients, you know many many different people reporting data. So of course there were errors in the data. You know it wasn't possible to scrub the data. Certainly if we didn't want to if we wanted to get it published in a timely way rather than waiting a year and then publishing it uh, farther down the road. And so um, I won't name names, but you know, certain people uh, you know, went on the warpath and attacked the recovery board and the whole recovery effort uh, for the fact that there were zip codes that didn't exist, congressional districts that didn't exist, and, and so forth. So um, we, got, we were worried about this because we didn't want the lesson of this to be, be transparent and publish your data, hand ammunition to your enemies to come and pillory you for all of the terrible and evil things that you're doing. So um, part of the culture change then is not simply getting government people to um, uh, think about public data as the default um, and to be rewarded an incentive for publication rather than hoarding. Part of the culture change is also uh, uh, more broadly in the community to get people to understand that data can be published and it's not perfect. Um, and, uh, and we will collectively work together to figure out what the errors are and report them and then fix them. And, you know, from the perspective of the recovery board the, or, or the publisher of data, the right reaction to these kinds of complaints is thank you. Uh, thanks for pointing out the errors. Let's now go and fix them, and collectively we'll make this data set better. So anyway, that's, that's sort of a, a kind of an interesting, um, to me, kind of an interesting lesson about the nature of the, the culture change that we need. It's not just inside government. It's within the community of users, broader community of people that are interacting with the data. Um, there is a metadata issue here, which is how can you signal the level of confidence that you have in the data, even if it's not 100%. It'd be nice to have metadata tags and fields that can help people express whether data is tentative, subject to revision, and so forth. That's something I think we can fix. Um, one debate that we've been involved in that I want to highlight is a debate around public access to taxpayer-funded uh, research. Um, and uh, uh, I, I can't express any views about this because we have an ongoing, um, we had a, a public notice of inquiry at the Office of Science and Te Technology Policy. The comment deadline is now finished, but we haven't published the output from that. So I can't tell you anything about what we think about it. But what it uh, addresses is the question of when the taxpayers are through a research uh, agency like the National Science Foundation, National Institute of Development, and so forth, paying for research, should the <laughs> papers that result from that research be free and publicly available? The uh, leading agency in this area is the National, Institute, uh, National Institutes for Health, which has a policy of uh, 12 months. So they say uh, uh, 12 months after your publication of a paper in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, it must be made free and publicly available on the internet. And so the question that uh, uh, that uh, the White House posed um, was, um, what do you think? Should this be expanded? Should it be covered, uh, addressed to different fields? Should it apply to the data that underlies the papers? Um, should it apply to um, uh, uh, different disciplines in different ways? Some disciplines have, might have publication schedules and expectations that are different from other disciplines. Economics might be different from bioinformatics uh, or whatever. And um, uh, and finally, how do you do this in a way which preserves the viability of publishers uh, as providers of peer review and the functions that they provide that are, that are sort of valuable? What's the right length of time? Anyway, these were all questions that were flagged. And anyway, it's interesting because um, uh, in a lot of ways, I think that address a lot of the, a lot of what you think about that is similar to what you think about the law.gov project, which is to say, you know, are there ways in which uh, running uh, uh, law-related databases on a user fee basis is better than law-related database on a free and public uh, resource basis. Um, yeah, the same thing is, uh, is sort of true. If you believe that the, that the journals and publishers and providers of peer review are providing a valuable service, then how do you configure the incentives to enable them to keep doing that but still vindicate the objective of uh, public access to information over the long term? Um, and I think that's one of the things, at least on the federal side, that we've got to work through is, you know, we've got the PACER database, which is, uh, you know, fee-supported database. Um, and there are, uh, is a, 
you know, there's an argument about whether it should be made uh, uh, free and publicly available to whoever wants it um, without having to pay money or uh, should continue to be supported by the lawyers and law firms and other people who primarily access it today. Um, so I think that's all I'll say for right now. Um, I'm happy to take questions and happy to also like touch on other things if you think there are other things that are worth touching on, Carl or Jamie. So I, can I start with the same question that I asked David, which is um, uh, coming into the job, um, things that you found to be easier than you had expected, um, things where there was uh, resistance, and if so, what the sources of those resistance are, and sort of strategies for overcoming uh, resistance to these uh, initiatives? Um, so, you know, in, interestingly, what part of my answer is is the same as, as David's, which is that I'm, I'm endlessly surprised at the frequency with which sort of classified national security kinds of barriers uh, are erected to the things that we want to do. Um, and it's just an orientation for the federal government. You know, they, they take seriously, and I think rightly so, the obligation to keep people safe. And so the idea that bad things shouldn't happen on your watch is, is very common. And we have many, many different agencies that have some um, intersection with a classified world. And it means that they've got a unit that does classified stuff and that protects data. And um, um, so I, anyway, I've been surprised at that. I thought that, you know, here I am as a civilian going into a civilian role. Um, I wouldn't interact with that very much, but, but, uh, we, but we do. So, um, so like classified intellectual property treaties, for example. For example, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, 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 in the trade negotiation world, <laughs> broadly speaking, you know that stuff does not happen in public. Diplomatic negotiations don't typically happen in public. And um, I will say the uh, U.S. Um, supported the publication of the ACTA text, uh, which went public, I think, last week. So that is a step forward on the transparency front. Um, it took some doing, <laughs> but it was a step forward. Um, but it makes people nervous too, right? Because there is a pretty compelling case to be made for a lot of diplomatic stuff to happen not in public. And um, 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 figuring out how to persuade people that you can do so in this case without jeopardizing your ability to do what you, you can be public and open in this case without jeopardizing all of these other important things you need to do over here, that's a real, that's been a, you know, that's been a challenge. Um, some things have been easier, though, and, and I will say that in every single agency that we've had to deal with, there is some small cadre of really bright, talented, dedicated people, m actually many of them, but a small cadre, many people that are like that, but a small cadre of people who really have kind of a fervor around open government and changing the culture of the agency and, and opening it up. I haven't found any agency yet where they're, that is bereft of that kind of person, and that makes the job uh, uh, much easier. To follow up, if I could, um, one of the difficulties that we found with science commons is getting people to think about multiple visions of access. So a lot of people understood the idea of open access for the Mark I human eyeball to a printed version or a digital version of a scientific paper. Scientists should be able to read. Right? So they got that vision of access. But the idea of access that would be machine readable and, as you mentioned, integrated with data, right? the idea of access of a type where we don't even know the kinds of things that will come from the access because we haven't brought them up yet, which is entirely the point of why we need the access, that is a much harder kind of case to make because you're talking about, you are talking about things that have not yet been invented as being one of the things that are benefits from there. One way to have a kind of confidence is that is to come from a culture, say a Silicon Valley culture, where you've seen that happen again and again, and you start to think, you know, if I walk out onto the crowd, they will actually, you know, bear me up. There's, there, there is a reason to believe this will happen. Obviously, that doesn't always happen. Um, David gave the lovely example of the guy who finds the George Washington letter in the bankruptcy records, and maybe that makes people rethink the idea that opening uh, the archives to citizen um, access uh, makes sense. Have you found ways of explaining to people why access means more than just letting some people read for less cost? And if so, how did you use examples and concrete solutions in order to make that point um, real to them? Um, so it's a great question. Uh, so, um, so anecdote, 
-hmm. example, and fantasy, mm -hmm. right? These are kind of the levels at which we've been trying to make these arguments. So the anecdotes are all about uh, uh, real live, you know, examples where, uh, you know, you publish data, it gets mashed up in unexpected ways, and it becomes very, uh, you know, useful. So, for example, the, the, I mean, the Federal Register example I gave before is, you know, one, um, uh, Dave, uh, Tim Berners-Lee tells this great story about um, uh, bicycle crash data um, that uh, in, 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 in his, his, part of what was the centerpiece of his case to the British cabinet. So Gordon Brown mm -hmm. had this, you know, the Labor Party had this political scandal about expenses. And so suddenly they felt a, a strong, compelling political reason to show that they could do something on openness and transparency in government, which coincided beautifully with Tim Berners-Lee's, you know, kind of um, uh, urgent uh, raw data now movement that he was trying to push on the British. So they actually brought him in, and he got a, his chance to pitch the cabinet on sort of open op, uh, on on what became data.gov.uk, but is sort of an open data approach. And uh, and so anyway, he uh, I'll spare you the long story. That he's got a TED talk which is worth looking up online and watching. But he tells the story about um, how the uh, police had pulled back. A, uh, a, a database uh, that listed uh, bicycle accidents in London. And he showed how um, it took exactly 48 hours from the publication of bicycle crash locations for someone to put up an app that would show you the least crash likely route to get from anywhere in London to anywhere else in London on a bicycle. So you want, you know, at, at, at according to time of day. Mm -hmm. But it literally took 48 hours because all you need to do is have the data, have the routes. Um, you know, have an online map. They did it on OpenStreetMap. And anyway, it's like, you know, it's awesome. So now all of a sudden, you're going to have fewer people dying from bike accidents uh -huh. because the police put this data up online and other people were able to mash it up and, and do it very quickly. The, the Fed thread, which the Princeton, uh, Ed Felton's group at Princeton put up on the backs of the Federal Register, took 24 hours. You know, like XML goes up, 24 hours later, I'm entering my zip code and getting Federal Register notices anytime something comes up. It's awesome. You know, it's totally, uh, it's totally great. Um, so anyway, that's the level of anecdote. Um, the uh, the examples are sort of um, uh, what I mean by that is is kind of celebrating the people who do the right things. Um, and you know, one of the best examples here has been not so much about public data but about simply the value of digitized data, and that's in the context of electronic health records. Um, uh, or uh, the smart grid would be another one that we could talk about here. So electronic health records, when you get, uh, when everybody in this country, which uh, will happen by 2015, has an electronic health record uh, in a standardized format that is private, secure, uh, but also easily exchangeable from healthcare provider to healthcare provider, and easy to, um, e into which it'll be easy to import labs data, pharmacy data, all this other stuff. So you're going to have this sort of record. Once that exists, um, using uh, fairly rigorous uh, anonymization and de-identification techniques, you're going to end up with this huge pile of data points. Um, and we will be able to do really th many, many things, but three things that I think are worth highlighting. One is you can improve the patient outcomes dramatically because you know, the patient's data is easily accessible. You can you know, uh, figure out what the right diagnosis is based, based on knowing a lot of things about them. Second thing, though, which is where the data is important, um, is in aggregate, you can do something called comparative effectiveness research, which is you know, to say for a patient that has my characteristics with my symptoms, what's the best outcome I can hope for, and how do I get there? And the way you figure that out is by doing statistical analysis on all the patients that had your characteristics, your kinds of symptoms, figure out where they got to and what got them there. What are the different outcomes? So you can test drugs this way out in the real world as opposed to highly sterilized clinical trial settings, which are important but limited in what they can teach you. Um, and it can tell you quite a bit. Finally, um, the big thing that you'd like to be able to do is move the whole system from pay for procedure to pay for outcome. The only way that you can fairly price outcomes is if you've got massive piles of data. But if you could ever pull that off, it would be awesome for doctors, for example, because then their economic incentives are precisely aligned with the patients, which is do exactly what you need to do to get them to the best possible outcome, but don't do any more. 
And, uh, uh, and if you do, you know, you get uh, uh, paid this much and you may have an incentive to outfit them with a wireless heart monitor or whatever. Anyway, it's going to be really great, but it's only going to be done if there's this massive pile of data that you can do the analysis on. There's a similar story around the smart grid, which is um, uh, basically digital home energy use data that will flow out across the, ener the wires. It's coming. You're, actually, the utility um, company uh, uh, for North Carolina is one of the most interesting and adventurous um, and sort of forward thinking in this area. But anyway, homes will be outfitted with smart meters. They'll generate data. You'll get these big databases of data, and then you can figure out how to reduce energy consumption yourself across communities. Very useful. So anyway, those are examples of how to sort of do it. And then the final part uh, is, is, you know, kind of fantasy, which is outlining what might be possible. Um, just by way of analogy, you know, one of the biggest struggles that we're engaged in right now on a, on a policy level is, is trying to free up more wireless spectrum for data. So moving it off of inefficient old, you know, uses for uh, wireless data. And we are confronting exactly the problem you outlined, which is that we are absolutely confident that the technologies to take advantage of this spectrum much more effectively will exist because we've seen them in the lab. But we're asking people to kind of take on faith that they're really going to flourish and develop in a way which in Silicon Valley seems totally predictable. Like, of course, we're going to, you know, pack 100 gigabit per second connections into air. You know, we're going to be, of course, we're going to be able to do that. But we're asking people to take it on faith and uh, uh, in the in the context of um, sort of the data problem generally, that, that remains a problem. You know, it remains a problem to tell people, uh, to convince uh, holders of data in the federal system that their lives are going to be easier, their jobs are going to be, their, their agencies are going to be more effective, they're going to look better um, because some third party that they haven't even met is going to go off and do things with this data. It's not an easy, it's not an easy challenge. Thank you. Other questions? I got one. Okay. Sorry, Jay. Um, public health and national security are often seen as public goods where the government will invest in uh, software development. Holding government accountable is also a public good. And I wonder if you see um, not just government making the data available, but also helping develop the software in an open source way that would help us understand the data. Um, so this is a, this is a, this is a recognized problem, at least by us. So um, one of the things that we've, we've sketched out for data.gov, for example, is we need to add <coughs> a much more robust set of developer tools. So that's on the roadmap for this year. And we've got new people coming in on detail to work on data.gov um, that will be prioritizing that. Um, one of the you know, sort of tensions around uh, public data, I mean, to add another one to the pile, is the tension between raw data and visualization. So we've been telling people, don't worry about visualizing. You know, it's, it's a natural inclination for people to think how they're going to make the data look. But just get the data out there in raw, unvarnished you know, form as data feeds. And then also worry about visualization, but just do it as a very separate activity from the data. Having said that, though, for people to really hold the government uh, accountable, they have to be able to see and grasp and comprehend and visualize the data. So that's another thing that we've got sort of on the roadmap is, you know, simple standard, um, not spin proof, but spin resistant, you know, visualization formats, simple graphs. You know, this is kind of Ed, Edward Tufte style visualizations, but simple, straightforward presentations of data that can be applied to any data set that exists within the data.gov universe. Um, uh, beyond that, um, I would hope that agencies will develop and contribute analytics tools that, you know, go you, take you beyond visualization to do things like mashups and um, cross comparisons of, of data across multiple dimensions and that sort of thing. That's not something we currently have on our roadmap. I could imagine that we might, but I'm hoping that that'll be sort of development out in the agency world um, that we'll be able to build on or you know, hijack into the data.gov uh, universe. We're still kind of operating on, you know, year-to-year -year planning cycles for data.gov, and that's just not there yet. Carl, you had a question? Yeah, um, so in terms of anecdotal poster children, uh, the Federal Register is, is a great example. It went from ASCII text and PDF to XML. The paywall went down. It's authenticated. Um, in order to find other good examples and bad examples in the executive branch, where should we be looking? 
Um, how do, or do you have ones off the top of your head? Of uh, and and we're talking primary legal materials here. So rules, regulations, yeah. codes. Um. Well, so let me let me say this. I, I think there are there are a lot of bad examples. Um, uh, by which I mean I think there are a lot of agencies that sit on rule sets and official publications that are not currently even in the pipeline for uh, digitization in standardized machine-readable formats. Um, that's sort of the bad news. Um, and I can think of, of, of many of those. I mean, almost every agency publishes manuals, um, guidelines, um, and uh, uh, rule books of various descriptions, on, on particularly the ones with rulemaking authority. Um, that are not really even in the pipeline. They may be low demand, they may be out of date, they may be um, uh, things that they want to keep offline for various reasons. Um, in terms of good role models, I, I would say one that I'm, I'm kind of a fan of uh, is, is uh, Health and Human Services. So uh, HHS produced what I think is a great open government plan and it explicitly addresses this idea of clearing up the backlog of all of their official materials, of all the official stuff, the rule sets and everything else that, um, that are, are published. In fact, they mentioned Law.gov as an inspiration for that. That is not coincidentally <laughs> true. Um, but that's one, I mean, that's one that we've been pointing to because it was just, that was a really um, awesome forward thinking kind of plan and that's one that I would sort of use as a role model. But I think, you know, I, th I think of Law.gov, you know, broadly, which is like, you know, n not necessarily, not just the primary legal materials that, you know, are things that carry the force of law, but more broadly, you know, agencies do a lot of regulation, and a lot of that stuff happens in the form of soft things like, you know, if, if you think about like the DOJ prosecutor's, you know, guidelines. I mean, that's uh, critically important to understand the way in which the law is being applied and um, is an example of the kind of thing that should be up, you know, online because of the uh, uh, because of the critical nature of the information that it contains for you know people that are living under our, our, our in fact, laws. In my opinion, that counts as primary legal material. There, there's a differentiation between authoritative legal materials, and and those are things with the force of law. Uh, but primary legal materials, to me, are things issued by governmental entities that might be used in interpreting the authoritative materials in a congressional hearing, I think, is a great example of that. It, it's not the force of law, but you can't interpret a law without the congressional hearings that led to the enactment. And so those manuals and, and hearings and, and dockets, in fact, that led to rulemaking procedures all, to me, are within the scope of, of the law.gov effort. Uh, maybe not as central as, let's say, a Supreme Court opinion, um, but to me those are important in, in that a governmental entity that issues the law needs to be able to to point to those and make them available to the public. Yeah, I mean, if we collectively take as our starting point where Jennifer started us off, you know, namely the, the, the problem of um, things that a citizen needs to be able to read to understand how the citizen is to behave um, or, uh, or, or where the limits of freedom lie or however you want to think about it, that material is important because it tells you what the agency is going to do, how they interpret the law. Um, anyway, so I agree with that. We have a, that's, that's something that we have a, a lot of work. I mean, there, there's a lot to be done in that area before we can sort of look in the mirror and feel good about where we're at. Okay, thank you. Um, let's thank Andrew.